Welcome to Awareness to Action, a podcast brought to you by Northwestern Community Services Prevention and Wellness. I'm your host, Casey, a social worker and prevention and wellness specialist here in Virginia. Our goal is to bring you stories of people who are engaging in their communities in meaningful ways, to hopefully inspire and encourage you to seek those connections in your own community. Hello, and welcome back to Awareness to Action. Today, we have Rick Griffin joining us on the show. Rick is the founder and CEO of the Neuro Leadership Academy, a new enterprise committed to using neuroscience to facilitate personal and professional development. Rick holds a master's degree in education and uses his education to develop innovative content and to deliver engaging presentations. He speaks to thousands of groups from all over the country and is widely recognized for his work with trauma-informed and resilience-based practices. As the former executive director of a trauma-informed therapeutic residential program for struggling teens, Rick has firsthand experience with developing and implementing strategies and structures that foster resilience. Rick is so passionate about the ways that understanding the brain allows us to better understand ourselves. His many years of experience just underscores his commitment to creating change from a unique approach. I really enjoyed our conversation and I left with many takeaways and I hope you do too. All right, Rick. Well, thank you for joining us on the podcast today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Why don't you start by telling us about your current role and then maybe walking us backwards to kind of go through how you got here? Okay. Well, current role is kind of complicated. Got two um, pretty major roles. The first of which I am the master trainer for a community resilience initiative uh, out of Walla Walla, Washington. And that's kind of been a sustained thing for the last uh, several years, and I'm just launching a new endeavor. Just created an organization called the Neuro Leadership Academy, and I'm really excited about that. So those are the two roles that kind of keep me busy. Can you share a little bit more about your new endeavor? Yeah, so it is a a neuroscience-inspired professional development, so trying to really look at doing professional development in a way that folks can see how the brain is actually working and the mechanisms that are involved in some of the things that, that such as human behavior and, and the things that we do. And we've got a lot of misunderstandings about the brain and how it is involved in, in what we do. And uh, some of those misunderstandings have some fairly dangerous consequences. Uh, and so being able to do some instruction on what's really happening up there, that's yeah, kind of important to me. So I'm really excited about that. Our listeners do not get to have the joy of vision as I do. So for our listeners, you should know that (laughs) we'll be talking about the brain a lot today. And Rick is sitting in front of several uh, illustrations of the brain, highlighting different parts of the brain. So just clear from the start that this is something that you're passionate about. Can you speak a little bit to where the idea for this academy came from? I hear what you're saying about why you're doing it, but something must have gotten you to say, this is the place I want to be. I can make this happen. Yeah, I I think where it really came from is uh, reading about the brain. And um, uh, Dr. Lisa Feldman Barrett, one of my uh, favorite neuroscientists to read, and and her first book, uh, How Emotions Are Made, and she talks about what the brain's primary purpose was. And for such a long time, I always thought the brain's primary purpose was for us to learn. And she says, well, no, it's to run the body and it's to help us survive. And I thought, well, gosh, that really puts it in a different perspective. So that gives us a, uh, at least for me, it gave me a different why things are happening. Uh, And as I followed that through, I could see how that really starts to uh, compromise some of the howls that I thought were out there. I'm thinking, wait a minute, this, if that is really the why, then there are going to be some challenges in the way that's done. Um, For example, uh, memory. I remember being on YouTube and I saw that the, the gorilla, I don't know if you've seen that um, Chris Chabrie and his group was doing a, a little experiment where two basketball teams are passing a basketball and you're supposed to count the number of passes uh, with the team wearing a certain jersey. And uh, a gorilla comes out in the middle of the, the, the screen and kind of well, a human wearing a gorilla costume and kind of beats on the chest and goes off. And then you realize that over 44% of the world doesn't see the gorilla. And I'm thinking... That has some huge implications for what we do and, and, and for how we understand human behavior. And so I uh, really started to get excited about if we really understood what was happening in the brain, I think that we maybe we would have uh, less challenges in communication with one another. You start to see some of the things that are happening in the workplace and, and burnout that's occurring and the, the, the folks who feel like safety becomes an issue in the workplace. 
And a lot of it is just, that's kind of how the brain is wired to keep us alive. And it just has some consequences in, in, in our society. And if we understood that instead of blaming each other for some of those faults, I think we would be a, a, a much more, I, I guess, collaborative society. So that's what really kind of inspired me is really thinking about, gosh, if, if we could understand more about what the brain does, maybe we would uh, blame each other a lot less. Yeah, absolutely. I want to get more into that later how, because you've shared before just how much every thought and every word matters to our communities around us. So I want to put a bookmark on that because I'm a big believer that all things we do, you know, propel us further into the future things that we're doing and are going to do. So let's talk a little bit about the Community Resilience Initiative, because I'm sure that had a huge hand in kind of getting you ready to start this new endeavor. So can you talk a little bit about the journey of the initiative and and what you all do in your work? Absolutely. So the Community Resilience Initiative really has a, a, a mission to really communicate with the rest of the world about uh, trauma and resilience. And so when I started learning about trauma and resilience, it became something passion, passion for me to say, yes, it needs to be shared. Uh, I was uh, actually um, running a therapeutic boarding school for struggling teens. And the model that we had at the time was just kind of that basic, you know, kind of boot camp model for teens. And because we didn't know any better. And it just seemed so uh, abusive in, in its structure and uh, just all the deterrence for behavior and things. Thought, well, this, this doesn't feel right. And so I started to explore some of the research and, and found the uh, adverse childhood experiences study and saw that, wow. This is a, it just really helps us to uh, have a better understanding about who we're working with and why some of our strategies didn't work. And so we started operating our facility like that, and we started seeing the great changes uh, a couple of years into it and started realizing that, wow, this is great information and, and I shared that with our board of directors. And I thought, well, Rick, you know, that really seems to be your passion is to go to communicate this. If, if Instead of just impacting the 200 plus kids that we may have every day, but, you know, why not go out there and share this uh, in, in the context of community? And so, yeah, that was uh, that's what I wanted to do. I ran into uh, Terry Barilla at the time. She was operating the Children's Resilience Initiative. And uh, so we were uh, you know, old friends and we were getting we were talking about the, the science and the emerging nature of the neuroscience. I said, well, it it is far beyond children. And she started realizing, and this is about a community. If we can get this information out to the community. So kind of rebranded, changed the name and, joined forces and called it Community Resilience Initiative. And that's kind of what I've been doing is getting out there and, and sharing with the community about the, the nature of trauma and resilience and, and its impact on behavior and its impact uh, on our society. So a, a quick overview for those who are not familiar with ACEs. Can you give us just a little snippet for understanding of what that means? Sure. The Adverse Child Experiences Study came out almost 20 plus years ago. But a couple of researchers looking into the, I, that the idea of what are the factors, what are the risk factors that, that, that really make it complicated for someone to live their best life, so to speak. And so they discovered 10 factors that if they are present in an individual's life, it, it increases the likelihood that complications could occur. And these 10 factors came in two separate domains uh, of five. The, the, the first set of five were uh, five factors that really dealt with the family dysfunction is the, the label that was on the research. So the, the things that occur inside of the family before the age of 18 that really could complicate an individual's life and uh, factors like abuse and, and sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and neglect as well, physical abuse or physical neglect and emotional neglect. And seeing that those are important factors to consider when, when looking at what someone's challenges might be. And then factors that are also dealing with family dysfunctions are the things that people are just exposed to in their household and shelter. That when you've got a parent who may be incarcerated, a parent or a caregiver that's dealing with drugs and alcohol, a parent that may be dealing with substance abuse and that grief loss inside a family. And then it's those factors that were being studied to say, if an individual is uh, uh, dealing with those factors, it is going to cause some some complications um, um, going forward. And it really has uh, shown to have some significant, uh, not only um, mental health challenges, but some physical health challenges. And there's been lots of research that, uh, that connects that to some of our adult onset diseases. 
uh, into adulthood. So huge um, study and uh, with huge implications in terms of uh, what we're doing. I would love it if you could tell us about the light bulb moment, which I'm sure based on what you've already shared was less of like a switch flipping on and more of a like a chandelier with a dimmer getting brighter and brighter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, where you kind of adjust it. That, that time of understanding adverse childhood experiences, looking to the young people that you're working with and saying, oh, this makes so much sense. This will change everything. Like what, because, you know, for people like me, the robust knowledge about ACEs already existed when I was entering the mental health field. So I had the benefit of starting my career with that, but you're someone who received that information and said, oh, this is going to change everything I do. So I, I would just love it if you could share about yeah. that. Well, it, um, I'm from a generation that where uh, the public policy of the time was looking at three strikes and you're out and, and seeing that, wow, if we just create a strong enough deterrent, then no one is ever going to want to do anything uh, that goes against um, uh, the welfare of the public. And we saw that didn't work. And as a matter of fact, it, it had the uh, adverse effect. It, it, we, it's really started to, to mushroom in terms of our population of the incarcerated uh, folks. And so I was looking at that and seeing then what is it about uh, how we work with individuals that can be that has a, a greater impact that that can be more effective and then combining that with um, at least the ACE study with my own life and seeing well yeah that makes sense now I can see why I might have uh, some challenges in certain areas be, because of things that I was exposed to in my childhood and if I'm looking at that same lens with the students that we are working with uh, perhaps. It's not just a nature of uh, their strong-willed kids. That's kind of what we refer to them, that strong-willed kids, and we just need to find a way to, to help them with that, that maybe it's a, a lack of skill and not will. Uh, maybe they don't have the, the ability to handle their frustration in any other way than to uh, respond with yelling or screaming or even physical confrontations. Uh, so once I started making that connection, and like I said, it, it is a dimmer. You start to see that if it's not, strong deterrent, what is it? And for us really looking at that, how could we then begin to develop uh, the skills for individuals to have uh, better emotional regulation in a sense and, and be able to handle their frustrations, be able to do things that are much more beneficial? Because uh, I think that at least the students that we were working with, they wanted to fit in, they wanted to belong. They just didn't know how. And so building enough relationship to have enough influence in their life to begin teaching them some of those skills just opened up a whole new world and thought that, are there others that are aware of this? Uh, or are there still folks and still industry still thinking that, no, it just got to give a stronger deterrent. If that one's not working, you know, find another one that's even harsher then. And, uh, and I think that we're seeing, as I look back, I, I see much of the industry of dealing with struggling teens was still using that. And, and unfortunately, some still are uh, using that model. But when I was able to make that shift and saying, no, there's got to be a better way. And then starting to practice some of those uh, techniques, some, uh, some of those uh, strategies, and then seeing the outcome really made the difference. Because I was kind of skeptical at first. I, mean, I, I It made sense. But I thought about how, how does this really work in practice? And so when we started implementing some of those strategies on our facility, uh, like our restraint, we had, unfortunately had a horrible um, policy of, about uh, physical restraints. And it was hard. It was hard on staff to physically restrain students and for other students to see that. We just thought it was just an awful practice. Uh, but when we started our trauma-informed practices, uh, those numbers of restraints almost disappeared. I mean, we were restraining sometimes, you know, 10, 12 times a week. And it went down to one a year. And then the, the last couple of years we were operating, I don't even know if we restrained a, uh, an individual at all. Uh, even for extreme safety, we started realizing that there are other ways to handle these situations. And when we saw that, we thought, because if these strategies work, are there others? <laughs> you know, if it can be so powerful in this line, what else can we do? And uh, we started to realize that it's not just for our students. The, the staff started saying, well, wait a minute, if that works 
for them. What if we do that amongst ourselves? And so we started shifting some of those practices to even what uh, the, the the employees did and, and, and saw the difference that made. And so when we are going out there now and sharing that and realizing, you know, this isn't just about... Uh, you know, kids on the other side of the track, so to speak. You know, th this is about human nature. This is about human behavior. If you've got a brain, you've got some challenges because of how your brain is designed. And if you can understand that and understand how somebody else is processing things, you can find much more effective ways uh, to work with them and, and, and ways that are far less abusive, far more supportive, and far more effective. So uh, I think that's kind of the journey. So yeah, it wasn't just an automatic switch just a process of believing in it, I guess, and then trying it, seeing the results and saying, well, yeah, and, and then making broader transfer. If it works here, what if it, what if we tried it here? Would it work in this capacity? And uh, so I, I just think we, we could see the huge advancements that we're starting to make it, into a much more supportive, effective environment and thought, we can't go back now. now this is, it, it, it's too effective and it is too powerful let's not only uh, do this in our facility, but let's share this with the rest of the country. Yeah. It takes a real courage to decide to pursue something different. I mean, especially at a time where ACEs were not as talked about for you and your colleagues to say, there's got to be a different way. And it's so easy to stick with the status quo and be like, well, this is how we've been doing it. So it's how we've got to, how we've got to stay. And so, I also think something really fantastic about utilizing adverse childhood experiences to understand those around us is, as you said, it's not like, well, all these kids are traumatized, so here we go, you know, let's do a one size fits all for everyone. It's saying, no, everyone has different experiences that have shaped them. And there are different ways to approach those experiences for students and staff, you know, or youth and adults alike. We all have our stuff, <laughs> you know. We, we do, and, and and it was challenging. Uh, we had staff that were saying, oh, this will never work. You know, they're just going to uh, end up running the whole facility. It's going to be awful. And we, we certainly didn't see that as an outcome, but we did start to realize how um, that variety really was the norm you know, in terms of specialization and our customization more like it, it was so helpful that any time that you were, that same thing that really worked well for one student wouldn't work at all for another one. And, and we started realizing that, well, this is, that's okay. Now we have to find a way to, to still operate in a collective where people have very specific needs and started to communicate in that terms of, well, well, why did that kid get that? And I didn't, because well, they needed that and you don't, but when you need something, we'll be there for you too. And, you know, and having the courage to to stick with that and believe that's going to matter. Even when the students are saying, well, that, you know, that's just favoritism and all the, the hardships of that. But once they could see it being practiced, and if we were really true to what we believed in, that can say, hey, remember when uh, you needed this and we did this for you? Yeah, that's what we do. We meet people's needs. You just don't need what he needs. And be grateful that you don't. Uh, you've got your own issues that, and things that you need, but we were there for you and we'll be there for them too. When they start to see that, and then they start to practice that amongst themselves, and when they go home and want to practice that with their families, that's when we start seeing that ripple effect and know that's what really matters is that when we start to see how this is so important, it's been so valuable for me, I want to share this with another group of people, see it start to grow. Yeah, and that empowerment of someone is seeing me and they're choosing to know me enough to know what I need and to ask what I need. And I want to make someone else feel that way. It strikes me as being very similar to what you're doing when you bring this to communities. Since learning more about the Community Resilience Initiative, something that I keep chewing on is how remarkable it seems to me that you are taking this knowledge and these tools to a lot of different communities. So you're taking the same base, the same toolbox to these communities, and then trusting that these communities can use their expertise and their knowledge of their population and the people that are in their care to apply them in the ways that they specifically need. At least that's what it seems from my outside view. So I would love if you could if that even sounds accurate, if you could speak to that kind of like collaborative expertise. 
So yeah, so, so for us, we developed a framework that really helped us to see how do we make this work? How do we build the capacity of a community using a scientific framework and the model, the acronym is KISS, K-I-S. So that K is for knowledge. And so we had to be on the same page with this, the, the knowledge. Current scientific findings. What does it say about adverse childhood experiences? What does it say about neuroscience? How do we understand the impact of somebody's experience on their life? And, uh, and then the I is for insight. And that's what really started to change when working in communities is, is helping communities understand that and in, have insight into who's in your community. What's it like for them? All communities are very different. All neighborhoods are different. All households are, are different. And, and it's important. Yes, know the science and that, that, that knowledge is important, but you got to have some insight in, into the individuals that you're working with and the uniqueness uh, of your community and, and, and of the collective that you're working with. And then and only then should you be thinking about what strategies might be helpful. Uh, too often, folks jump right into the strategies. Well, no, with, without the knowledge and the insight, you might use strategies that aren't helpful. They might have been great for this community, but they won't work at all in this community. Uh, and so uh, using that model and then that final S is structures. Can we start building some structures, some systems around this so we can continue to sustain it within our community? And even though it it's going to look very different than the community, maybe even right next door, that's okay. If it's working for us, let's keep it up and find a way to and empower folks to, to stay inside that. So uh, having that that roadmap uh, was really helpful for us and not getting caught into saying, well, let's just uh, here are the things that every community needs to do. And if you don't do it this way, you're not going to be helpful. Well, no, we, we don't know. We know what the, the, the science says, but every community has a very unique way of, uh, of even their authoritative structures uh, look a little different. And so use what you have and, and the influence that you have in your community to meet the needs uh, of your community and the needs will be different. And so it should look different. So it, it was really helpful for us to think about that. One of the analogies that we would used to use in the early days was about um, coffee. We'd ask a group, say, hey, uh, how many of you need a cup of coffee to feel you at your best in the morning? And of course, there's several people who would raise their hand and, and say, um, do you need that same cup of coffee right before bedtime? And most folks say, oh, no, that would be horrible. So we'll see, even us as individuals, we need different strategies. If we have some knowledge about what caffeine can do and have some insight in what it does to you specifically, then I can develop them some strategies to make sure I get you that cup of coffee right when you need it. And so helping people understand that if we follow that framework, it may look different. As a matter of fact, it will look different, but that's okay. You, you, as long as you're staying within the structure of what the science says and really truly having some insight into what do they need and what do I have, the, do I have the capacity to meet that need? And then what strategies, how do we make sure that, that we get what they need and find ways to sustain that? And, and so that KISS framework was really helpful in, in helping us get to communities and, and helping them understand that as, as much as uh, uh, we tried that in our community and it worked real well and you might say, yeah, how do I come to do it? Lala Washington did it. Well, that's not the point. You know, we can give you that framework, but you will have to take that step into your own journey as a community uh, in order to be really uh, effective. So it worked with the students that we learned and, and being specialized and customized with that. And then we saw that it's working with communities as well. Well, and I think there's a, a humility required, maybe on a different level than with the students, for both parties in the collaboration. Like when you're coming into the community, you have to have a humility that you do not know all the things about the community that you are not part of it and, and therefore can't fully understand it. And there's the humility on the community's part to say, we've got things working a certain way, but we're actually open to finding out how we might be able to change from this person who is not one of us. I mean, that's pretty awesome. <laughs> That's right. If, you know, we, we use the phrase, do you want to be right or get it right? And I was like, it's not about us being right. It, you know, let's get this right. Let's figure out what works. And the way we've been doing it may not work for other people and it may not work for this individual. So let's change and find out what works for them and get it right for them. So yeah, really helpful. Not easy at all, but <laughs> very helpful. Yeah. The good and hard work is really never easy, but <laughs> that's probably what makes it the right thing. This is a huge question and it's okay if you don't have an easy answer, but I'm curious what being a part of so many communities, even if just for that time of training, 
what has that given to you as an individual? Wow. Yeah, that's a great question. My, the first thing that came to mind was hope. It is so inspiring to realize that, boy, this is great work and it, it does have hope for some of the, the things we see not going well in, in our country. And you, you, you see that s small steps in, in many places, you, you see communities. And, and I, I think about uh, one of our, some of our earlier uh, communities in um, Charlottesville, Virginia, in, in, in your area. And you see just working with a couple folks that come down for a conference and you share a little understanding with them and they go back and they're spreading that within their city. And then years later, you go back and see how it's expanded throughout the area. And you know those kind of things are exciting for us, uh, working with San Antonio, Texas, and starting again, small group of folks. And now you see trained almost 12,000 people within the, the the city of San Antonio that, that are, are working within the city of San Antonio. And so it's, it's exciting and, and you, you really do see the hope and the, the fact that, oh gosh, you know, we had this horrible worldwide pandemic and, and then out, out of that, uh, all the emotional unrest and, and now we've got uh, workplace shortages and people don't want to work and uh, getting burned out when they do work and realizing that's okay. If we learn how to really support, really serve, really care for folks in in a way that meets their needs, uh, we'll get there. And so I know that may seem a little Pollyannish, but it's enjoyable. You know, every community I go into, you you realize, you hear the stories of, hear the hardships, and then you come back and you see that they're starting to chip away at that. How can that not give you hope? How can that not inspire you? You realize that that it's that this is going in the right direction and yes it's slow and, and yet sometimes there are you know for every two steps forward there's a step back and, and maybe steps to the side and <laughs> every other kind of direction but I, I i just i stay hopeful that it's moving in the right direction and it keeps me going it gives me a, a reason to uh, get on that next airplane and fly, fly away from my family for a little bit to knowing that yeah, you know, Rick, you, you, you're going to make a difference to, to the area that you're going into and it's worth it. It's hard, but it's worth it. Yeah. I don't think it sounds Pollyannish at all <laughs> to find hope and getting to be a part of those communities. We talk about this all the time on this show, but I just really feel that investing in our communities, just looking around us, intending to and caring for what's here is what will save the world. It's Maybe the only thing that will <laughs> is if we can keep caring for one another. I think that relates pretty well. well. Look at this little segue to what you've talked about with some of the neuroscience in knowing that what we say, do, think impacts everyone around us. So can you put on your master trainer hat and neuroscience love and, and share more with us? Yeah, well, it's a, and, and you're right. I think that when we start to see how uh, the brain uh, was designed to help us to survive, it, you know, the, the billions of neurons, they say close to 100 billion neurons, and children are actually born with more neurons than they will need into adulthood. And they go through this process called tuning and pruning, where those neurons, they kind of tune into the things that are really important that will help them survive better and prune away the things that aren't as relevant. And so they're uh, obviously that leaves them pretty vulnerable because it, it, they're trying to figure out what's important and what's not. But what that means is they're, they're paying attention. They need to, in order to survive, in order to tune into the right things, like language, for example. For a child, when they're exposed to eight different languages as a child and they need those languages to get their needs met, they're going to learn all eight of those languages. If you expose an adult to eight different languages, they probably won't learn any of them. And they say that the best way for an adult to learn a language is through immersion because you got to go get your needs met. You know, you're somewhere where you need, and your brain tunes into the things that are important and figures it out. And so the brain is, it specializes in, in, in observing its environment and figuring out what to do. So our environment is filled with people who are saying things and doing things, and, and we're picking that up and determining, is this important? And will this help me meet my needs? And, and it's changing who we are to our cellular level. 
when, when we, when somebody is saying something to us and, and I think about some of the toughest issues that we're facing in our society, you know, race has been one of those issues that uh, seems like it, it, it never leaves the, uh, the, the back burner. It's always in, in front of mind. But uh, if you think about it from the, the brain's perspective, a little baby who's uh, born to their parents, they're looking into the eyes, into the face of somebody who probably looks like them, shares a gene pool. And it's kind of way our, how our genes work is our caregivers more than likely um, look like us. And so you're getting your needs met from somebody who looks like you. And so that brain is processing, hey, someone who looks like this meets your needs. And then so someone who looks different might register as a little bit of a threat because like, well, that's not what meets your needs. And so we might think that sounds like, well, gosh, are, that means they're born prejudiced. Well, no, they're born to get their needs met. And that just seems to be the most efficient way for the brain is to find out, uh, go to places that are more familiar with what has done it in the past for you. And so it, it's, yes, there are some real dangerous consequences to racism. Don't get me wrong, but it starts from the perspective of understanding the brain that it's just doing what the brain does. And if we could understand that better and we realize that everything that happens in a child's life matters, if you were to expose that child maybe to different um, people who look a little different and they get their needs met from them, the child will learn that, oh, I can get my needs met from somebody who looks like this and somebody who looks like this and somebody who sounds like this and somebody who feels like this. They start to realize that they can get their needs met from a lot of different people and that's the way they'll pursue life. And I think that matters and <laughs> that can make a world of difference. And that's just one social issue like racism. Can you imagine what all the other isms that we could impact if we just understood that it's what people say, what they do, what they think and how they feel. That's a changing people and that's wiring them to, to learn to, to grow to either think that's something I need to avoid or that's something I need to pursue because that's what our brain is doing. Think about, well, how do I avoid the things that are harmful to stay alive? And how do I pursue the things that are beneficial so I survive? And that's what it does. And if we just had some knowledge of that, we really could feel those young minds with what the differences and the uniqueness that, that, that really the, this world embodies and realizes that you really can get your needs met from a variety of different sources. And it's one of those words, Casey, I'll tell you that it's hard for me, but I, I hear the word um, stranger danger and I just cringe. I think, no, that's not what we'd be saying. Because when you have a whole culture that's sharing a word, a concept like stranger danger, people are growing up thinking that things that are strange are dangerous. And so when you see somebody who looks different because that's not what you've been exposed to. You think that they're dangerous because that's the connection you make to that. And they're not necessarily dangerous. They're just different. What if we found a way to communicate it in difference? Say, you know, yeah, I understand that children are vulnerable and you just don't want them to be exposed to anybody. What if you could say something like that? If it's different, discuss this with a, uh, an, a, an adult instead of just mad, automatically think it's dangerous have a conversation. Don't say, hey, I saw this. This is different. What do you think? And then maybe the adult can educate them. Say, oh, well, sometimes people do have different skin colors. Sometimes people have different um, accents and their tone and their tonation and their volume and their cadence of their voice is different. And that's okay. It doesn't necessarily mean they're dangerous. So here, let's go figure out what we need to do to, to really keep you safe in these environments. It takes on a whole new different responsibility for one, for caregivers and a community but can you imagine what it would be like to live in a community where people really thought that way and realize that everything they say matters to a child in that community as they grow up and that can really help them to reach out and see the world in a different way? Everything they do, how they treat one another, you know, because those neurons from that child, they're trying to, they, they look around and say, oh, so that's how we should treat other people. And those are the neurons that get tuned into because that's what they see. And that's how they will probably grow up to treat other people. But what if it was the way that people are being treated was supportive and caring and full of curiosity and wonder, but yet still full of enough um, care and support that, that they weren't you know, left on their own. To but then no, we could still keep you safe, but still be curious and supportive. Don't you think that would make a difference in communities? So that's kind of the neuroscience part of that is that our brains the, that's running our heart, you know, it's telling our heart, you know, and, and to stay in that range that we need for survival, uh, so, you know, lungs, you know, put enough ox oxygen in the body to stay in that range. It's really just trying to find ways to help us survive. 
And if we present it with the right things in terms of what people say and do and, and feel and aspire to be and all those things, it would matter. It would make a huge difference. And the science of uh, epigenetics says it will matter to the cellular level. I mean, literally our genes might express themselves in different ways because of how people treat us. And thinking of all the adult onset diseases that we might be able to mitigate just simply by treating each other different. And that's certainly not hi hyperbole. You know, the medical community would tell us that, that yes, that, would, that, that matters. Stress is the underlying um, cause to many of our adult onset diseases. If we didn't have that stress because we felt comfortable and, and we felt that uh, we're not in a threat response every time we see things that are different, we wouldn't have the stress level. We wouldn't have the diseases. We would have a healthier, wiser, more autonomous communities. And, and so we've got a, a lot that we can learn uh, from the neuroscience. And I, I hope that we're taking uh, some of those steps now to, to make a difference. Yeah. Thank you for explaining that. It's It feels easy. Well, the way you explain it makes it feel easy to understand, especially how it would impact a child. But what can you explain a little bit more what that looks like between adults and the impact that can have for those of us who have already grown up? <laughs> sure. Well, um, I think about it this way. And I, and I love uh, Dr. Nadine Burke Harris has a TED talk that she talks about if you're walking through a park and a bear jumps out from behind a tree. Okay. Now, most people would probably run and scream. We do something to really keep ourselves safe from that bear because our sensory input or the sensations that we would see, you gosh, this big, huge creature, claws and teeth and hair all over. Um, something in our experience from our past that would say, you need to avoid that. And we would, our body would kick into a fight, or, our, our fight, flight, or freeze phenomenon and uh, cortisol and adrenaline would flood our systems. And, and that's helpful in that one instant when there is a bear behind a tree because we could run and maybe stay safe. But what she says is, but what happens when that bear comes home with you? And then you're constantly exposed to that threat response. And then that same response that helped you to stay safe now overloads you with that cortisol and adrenaline. And so now your, your body is full of it constantly. And we know that has some real adverse impacts on, on our body. And so adults are some of us that we are have been living with that high level of cortisol and adrenaline in our body, and it's, it's causing some damage to our, our, our body, but more so it has caused an effect on our experiences. There are some people that would uh, really hesitate to want to go uh, near a tree again. And that's not odd for somebody who think, well, of course, if that happened to you, of course you would feel odd about going next to a tree. But there's some brains that might be even more sensitive and say, I don't even want to go near a park. You know, that was too close. That was too close for comfort. So to really keep you safe, just stay away from parks. And then there's other adults. Their brain is so sensitive. They would say, you know, that happened on a Wednesday. And so just to prepare you on a Wednesday, I'm, I'm going to start dripping some cortisol and adrenaline through your system. And so you just can be a, a ready in case a bear does jump out from behind a tree again. And so on Wednesdays, they may grow, come to work a little more grumpy, a little bit more hypervigilant and, and a little bit more concerned because their brain is trying to keep them safe from a previous threat. And so we don't always see the tree or the bear behind it, but that individual, their brain still remembers. And like the, the great book says, the body keeps the score and it, it remembers. And so every day adults, we're dealing with other adults who may be registering a threat from an experience we know nothing about, but their body is still kicked into a threat response and they still have cortisol and adrenaline go to their body and they're still in that fight flight uh, mentality and they're trying to keep themselves safe by um, things that we might see as that, well, that's defensive behavior. You know, why are you being so defensive? But if we really think about it, what does that mean for an adult to be defensive? They're trying to defend themselves. They're trying to keep themselves safe. That shouldn't be so odd to us <laughs> to think that that's what that adult is trying to do, but we don't. We get upset by the defensive response and it starts to dump a little cortisol and adrenaline in our systems. And so now you got two defensive people butting heads together. And so our workplaces are full of individuals who misunderstand somebody's desire to keep themselves safe. They're looking at it as, oh, that you're just being rude. Uh, you're, you know, all the things that we uh, start judging people for really is the outcome of their brain trying to keep them safe 
but it's being seen as these behaviors that are rude and obnoxious and all the other things that people start to do just to try to get their safety needs met. And so I think if we just had a little bit more patience with other adults, we, we use the term, be curious, not furious. So when somebody at your workplace is, is being a little rude, be curious, what are they defending themselves from? And if we could put ourselves in that point, I guess if, if I was trying to keep myself safe, maybe I might use that technique as well, as opposed to that is so rude. Well, how can somebody do that to us? So the biggest impact that it has on adults is the impact on relationships. Uh, on, on we, we enter into this space where the most harmful thing known to humankind is that another human. <laughs> they, they represent all these possible threats because of what our brain has done to try to keep us safe. And we don't always understand that. And so we judge how somebody's trying to keep themselves safe instead of being curious, instead of being more gracious um, with, with their behaviors. I, I'm not saying it excuses bad behavior, but you see it in a different way when you start to think about it as, you know, how do I know that maybe that person's doing the best they can with what they know? That maybe they're, they've just got, a, they have a brain that pouring cortisol and adrenaline into their system today because long ago they were in a park and a bear jumped out from behind a tree. And uh, the brain doesn't really care if the, the bear's not behind every tree. It's just trying to keep you safe. And it's hedging its bets. It's doing it's the best it can to predict um, possible threats in advance, in the service of helping you survive. So the, the best way to describe how that really helps an adult is that our survival skills are killing us physically sometimes and relationally until we can understand what's really happening and, and give somebody a, a little bit more grace and perhaps help them find ways to keep themselves safe in the environment so they don't have to work so hard to do it themselves. Because imagine what you, if your brain is, is spending 100% of its resources just trying to keep you safe, you don't have enough resources to, to learn, to be polite, to be respectful, to comply with laws. I mean, all the things that we want other adults to do, you don't have the resources, the neural resources to do so because your brain is spending too much time just trying to keep yourself safe. But if we could jump in someone's life and, and if, with other adults, if we could offload some of that, and we can take on that and say, hey, I, I can help you to stay safe. So you don't have to use all of your resources to keep yourself safe. You can use some of that to comply and to be kind and to all the things that we want folks to do. But how can they when they're just trying to keep themselves safe and possibly aren't getting enough support to do so? So I know that's a long way to, to describing that, but I think it has such great implications for adults. And, and what we see every single day, any time that you are in the presence of another adult, you have no idea their history and the experiences that they're going through. You don't know what their brain is predicting to try to avoid and to try to keep them safe. And their behaviors that you see really could be just an attempt. And we have the right word. We say they're being defensive, but we just need to maybe change the connotation of that to say that they're just trying to protect, being self-protective. Maybe that's a better way. They're being self-protective. They're trying to protect themselves. And we would do the same thing if if, if we had their experiences, perhaps. Is, is yeah. Does that make sense? Does that just yeah. seem like it's kind of No, it, it absolutely does. And I appreciate the long answer. That's what I wanted <laughs> because I do, we've talked about this on the podcast before as well. You know, when we hear about ways to better care for kids, who have gone through hard things. It's fantastic and it's necessary, but not all of us are interacting with kids on a daily or even weekly basis in, you know, in some lives and some workplaces, you know, but I do believe that most of us are interacting with other adults on a daily basis in our homes, in our workplaces and our trips to the grocery store and the conversations about how to work better with one another and again how to care for one another in a more educated and knowledgeable way there I feel that those conversations are missing a lot of the time and so I appreciate that it's something that you're pursuing and I'm curious what it looks like to bring adults into those conversations and to provide that education with the hopes that they'll bring it back to their spaces 
Yeah, it, it really circles back to that first question you asked me ab about the Neuroleadership Academy. Um, it's when you look at the, the you break that apart, the neuro part of that is about the neurons. We all have them. We all have billions of them. It's not just kids that, that are having a tough life. It's not just people that are incarcerated. It's not just, you know, folks that we think that are having challenges. It's humans. And all humans have neurons that are designed to avoid threats and designed to pursue resources. And they're going to do it in certain ways. And if we come to understand those ways, we hopefully will be less judgmental into how someone does that when we know the why someone is doing that. And so I think that really expands the work. And so when I told you about, we changed the name of from Children's Resilience Initiative to Community Resilience Initiative, it just shows for me that continual learning of mine, it's even beyond a community into just how our brain works. Everybody who has a brain, it's not about any specific community. It's not about any specific person. It's about us all. And we all have something that we can learn from each other. And when we start looking at it that way, I, I think, it again, it, it brings hope. Uh, otherwise, it, it's almost, we're almost othering in the nature that we're doing it. Uh, oh, th those who have um, nine aces, we treat them like this. But if you only have four or two aces, we'll treat you like this. It, it, it starts to, to cause its own set of uh, in-groups and out-groups. But when we realize that we're all in the same boat, we all have neurons that are just trying to keep us safe. We may not like the way your neurons are keeping you safe, but I understand why they're doing it. And, and so if I could find a way to teach you a different way to keep yourself safe, that goes back to those skills. If I can teach you the skills to keep yourself safe in a way that fits with the community or with the standards of this collective, then we're all better for it. As opposed to just judging you or trying to lock you up or throw away the key in a sense, if you don't do it the way that we think you should, if you don't parent your kids the way we would like you to parent your kids, we'll take your kids away from you kind of concept. It's like, well, no, that's not helping us. We can say, well, what if we could find a way to help them care for their kids in a way that works for us as opposed to punishing them for not doing it that way? So I do think that it, it it expands who can benefit from the work to all humans. And, and it's not just about even the human service sector. Uh, it's not just about the educational sector. It's about anybody w w coming in contact with humans. And, and even it gives us a better understanding of ourselves. Because uh, sometimes we don't even know why we do some of the things we do. But when we look at it say, well, because our brain is collecting a lot of data that says you were under a threat. And we don't know why, you know, we all have that creepy feeling that we don't know why we feel that way, but it just feels creepy It's because our brain is picking up information that we don't know about. We have 11 million sensory receptors all through our body collecting data all the time. We're only aware of about 40 or 50 of them. So there's no way we know what's happening, but thankfully our brain is doing the good job of, of trying to help us survive. And there's some consequences to how it does it. If we can understand that and be a little more patient with one another saying, and, you know, Casey, I'm not going to blame her for what she's doing. Her brain is doing the best it can to try to keep her surviving. Let me just teach her a different way that will work better with my community of how, of how to keep you safe. And, and I think that can be so helpful. Um, and, and that's what really has, has driven me. I, I, it's so hard to see what's happening in our communities and in in, in what some of the isms have done to our population. It's the isms that I say, wish, I, I wish were wasms. I wish we could get rid of them, but right now we're dealing with a lot of them. And if we can understand that there's this huge spectrum of safety, uh, that you know, sometimes safety is, looks a little different. Sometimes you're uncomfortable and sometimes you're being terrorized. And if you could start to understand the difference and not respond to the world as though you're being terrorized when really you're just uncomfortable, I think we would probably find a better way to interact uh, with one another. But if we can't, if people start to feel terrorized when they're just uncomfortable, we're going to continue treating people in awful ways. And, and, and so, and we're going to have some of the challenges that, that we have in our society and, until we can understand what the brain is doing and how it does it and, and, and the, the, the differentiation uh, of what that means for all of us. And uh, so I'm I've been working on a, got a card deck and, and I call it 52 shades of safety. 
And so each card represents a stage of safety all the way from the, you know, the aces of the suits being the, the highest of the, you know, the, the being terrorized or even the, the, there are some suits that are some of the good emotions that, you know, being you know, um, loved and supported all the way down to the twos and the threes being uncomfortable, awkward, infatuated, it, it, knowing that all of it is a spectrum and, and we have to learn how to respond in different ways. And so I don't think any of us would ever have any problem if somebody was really being terrorized I, I don't think we would have any problem with them you know calling the police and any other support to try to help themselves but if they're using that same technique when they're just uncomfortable i think that's what really causes some of the, the angst uh, in our communities so if we could learn maybe the education you're talking about if we could really start to understand that hey there's information out there that can tell us that we're not always being terrorized we should have a different response to when we're terrorized versus when we're uncomfortable versus when we're awkward versus when we're frustrated, when we're irritated, when we're disappointed. Those all necessitate different responses. Let's learn how to do that. Let's learn what each other need from each other and how to help and respond that way. So when you're frustrated, let's, let me give you some ideas. Casey, if you're frustrated with me, here's how I'd like you to show that if you get, if that works for you, that way I know and that way I can jump right in and help you. But if you respond in some of these ways, it might trigger something negative in me and I might not be able to meet your needs as well. So if we could have those dialogues and, and really start learning those strategies for working with each other, I think we can make a difference. Casey, don't get me started on these things. <laughs> well, your passion is so evident and it's really exciting to hear you talk about it and and hopeful. Same thing you said before. It's hopeful to talk about it and to think about people having more tools and more words even to express themselves all those emotions you're listing I'm like how often do I say oh, my day was fine like what even is fine or I feel fine you can't really feel fine like I that's not truly how I feel but it's the easiest word to pull so it's the one I say and it's not really opening the window into how I'm doing and so I just like the idea of us being more curious about one another and again making a really crucial necessary change in doing so because we, what we're doing is not working, right? Like we, we can't go on with the way we're interacting with one another now. Something needs to change. You're right. And it may not be the perfect, but I'm willing to give it a shot. That is all we can do. What would you share with someone who's listening and is wanting to get engaged with this work a little bit more? They're feeling inspired by this conversation. Oh, gosh. Well, selfishly, I would always say, hey, come take one of our classes. I, I think that we share the science in a way that can be really helpful for folks. So that's always something I would encourage folks. But outside of that, I, I, I would say it, is take the lead uh, with yourself in and being more curious with the understanding of my brain's primary purpose is to run my body in order to help me to survive. And so how can I do that in, in a way that is a little bit more respectful for others and, and not just totally isolate and, and do things that are harmful to others in order to keep myself safe. So as long as I keep myself safe, can I do it in a way that is beneficial to others? So I think that would be an initial step, maybe a too elementary for some folks, but for others, it might be something that'll it hopefully at least get them started into seeing that I've got some responsibility. Everything I do, everything I say, everything I think, it matters to other people. It matters in the community I live in. It matters in the household that I'm in. It matters in the neighborhood that I live in. So do it in a way that can be more helpful. One thought, one conversation at a time. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. But let's have it. It's yeah. uncomfortable. Let's not just talk about it. Let's do it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I've so appreciated this conversation and I want to close out by asking you our our namesake question, what does the process of awareness to action mean to you? Awareness to action. Boy, I guess that's kind of what I was referring to and, and say, let, do it. I, I, I think it's great to be aware. And, and that's an initial and maybe even a critical first step. But if we don't turn into action, it, it, it's not going to serve us very well. And, and so I, I would say, expanding acting is is a, is an important piece of it 
And I'd also say, let's add reflection to that, then reflect and then act again. <laughs> so be aware of things, act on that, reflect on how you acted and keep on acting. So I, I think that's truly what changes us. I think about awareness is like the wedding actions, the marriage, you know, mm, <laughs> it's mm-hmm. like, the wedding. it's fun and it's great and we have a great party, but you know, it, it's about the day-to-day stuff. Let's get going. Let's act. Yeah. Well, I love that answer. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been wonderful. We'll be sure to share all the resources that you've mentioned and the work that you're doing in the episode description so that anyone listening can find their way to those resources. But thank you again, Rick. This has been great. Thanks, Casey. Take care. Thank you for listening. And thank you again to Rick for joining us. If you want to continue your learning, we've got lots of great resources from our conversation listed in the episode description. And make sure you subscribe to the show so you don't miss out on any of our future conversations this season. 